Welcome everybody to the e-commerce rockstar show. I'm your host, Alex Brown. We are interviewing some absolute rock stars in e-commerce, pulling out actionable strategies, tips, tricks, and advice for you to build a bigger, better, more impactful brand. And I couldn't be more excited for today's guest, uh, someone that I've known for many years now and respect deeply for many reasons and is so well accomplished uh, in e-commerce and direct response marketing. Uh, Bobek, thank you so much for joining us today, man. I'm really excited for what we're going to dive into today. Cool. It's always awesome to chat with you, Alex. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, I mean, when I first got introduced to you, it was uh, through Michael Lovich, and he said, you guys have to meet Bobek. He is like one of the best, most talented media buyers, uh, people who can scale a business like crazy in a very calculated, cool manner. Um, and I mean, you're one of the few guys that I know that has scaled a company past a billion in revenue. So it's just like an honor to have you on here. And would love to hear maybe a bit of the, the precursor to, you know, your work with Beachbody and stuff, but how you got into direct response and then sort of where you've headed recently, which is something I'm really interested in talking about today. Cool. Yeah. Um, so before I spent eight years, of, so context, I spent eight years at Beachbody, um, joined in 07. The business was already at 100 million. So there was pretty substantial scale there. Um, and then, uh, although not as necessarily professionalized and organized as you necessarily might think, I think everyone always has this idea that bigger companies are got everything dialed in, like they did enough of the right things to be at that place. And I think that was a big lesson there. Um, so built analytics for the first three years and then oversaw media and customer acquisition for the last five and left four years ago, um, little, just, just a little over four years ago, um, when we just crossed a billion in revenue. Um, prior to that, to your question though, just, I basically didn't know anything about DR, performance marketing, really any of that stuff. I had, I was a math major in college, did investment banking, went to Stanford business school. Um, and then kind of did my own thing. I had a magazine here in LA for a bit, uh, worked at the free or the legal version of Napster. And then, um, and then, yeah, I got lucky with a head under calling me, calling me up and saying, do you want to go work at a lifestyle business? Which I thought that meant actually my lifestyle, not, uh, health and fitness lifestyle, but it worked out pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, I took a 25% pay cut to go there. He didn't actually know that at the time, which was another good lesson to be learned. Um, and I just figured, look, I want to do something that's different than what I am. I, I love health and fitness. And then frankly learned and was taught, but also learned um, DR, performance marketing, frankly, network marketing uh, at Beachbody. And, um, and yeah, then so since I left four years ago, went to go start something, the team fell apart pretty quickly. Um, even though we'd planned for a while and just the nature of startups and then really started picking up clients. And so what I do now is generally I describe it as I work with performance marketers, helping them build their brands. And so both of those is important. Um, generally like the performance marketing, I think people get, but for me, brand is, are you paying attention to your customer and your product? Um, there are plenty of people out there who don't. Um, and so I don't have judgment. It's just not who I work with. Um, typically eight figures and above. Um, and then really I kind of love that, that point. Um, I'm better at scale and complexity, but I find the eight figure businesses, like there's a lot of impact I can have there. Uh, and generally speaking, you know, D to C ecom, um, really all media channels. Uh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not in the platforms buying directly, but again, I know enough. Um, but really at the end of the day, it's marketing stuff around acquisition, retention, analytics. And then really at the end, core of what I do, it's, it's strategy, analytics, and team. Like that's really where I, come in. I'm not a copy guy. I'm not a design guy, but I really know kind of the fundamentals of, uh, of building and growing. And um, yeah, we've got a handful of clients right now. It's, it's a lot of fun. And yeah, I get to see a lot of really cool things. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think what's been interesting is even the time that I've known you is you've really started to focus more on that brand aspect. And there are a lot of people and that's sort of how I've you know, positioned a lot of what I'm doing right now. And a lot of this very show is to help connect with people who are trying to build real brands. Mm -hmm. And what was like the, the main inspiration for that? Like, what did you see coming down the pipeline that was like, well, now we need to help more people build brands because performance side is great, but it always has a cap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so I think, first of all, I think a lot of people, especially when they come from the performance background, don't respond well to that word brand. And, you know, some of it's like, you know, do I just spend and I hope, um, from a media side, like it feels very Madison Avenue. Um, Cause a lot of them also frankly are like, look, I'm just trying to build my business. Right. So how do I like the idea of building a brand is great, but you know, like I'm just trying to build my business and whether you're at six figures or eight and nine, like I have that conversation a lot. Um, I actually started talking about this, you know, this bridging DR and brand performance and brand and, and frankly, frankly found that reaction. Um, and so, you know, part of it is, yeah, I mean, some of it does cap out. Um, at a certain point. I also frankly think like they're not mutually exclusive. And I think that's 
one of the bigger things right off the bat, which is that just because someone talks about brand doesn't mean like I'm anti-performance guy, right? And so, I mean, I quote unquote grew up in performance marketing, like I'm a math major. So like for me, measurement is kind of a big deal. Um, but really it was like around this idea of like product and customer, um, like, are you paying attention to it? And so if people want to invest in Facebook and TV and whatever it is, and they see that ROI. Um, but at the same time, and it's also frankly, like it's very, it can be efficient and effective. It's also a drug. And so as I start working with subscription businesses, for example, where like 12, 15% monthly churn, like you can build a business that way and certainly can build a eight figure plus business into the, with that. But I guess my question was like, is there another way or like, how do you do it better? Um, and frankly, looking at some of the, I guess the folks who are more brand businesses, um, what are they doing and how do you like basically create a hybrid here? Um, and so again, like when I think about like, I talk about like, sure, we're going to talk about the like, customer experience, you know, again, like it's not mutually exclusive to performance marketing. Um, but ultimately it's the people who want to build some level of sustainability and scalability. I just started looking at what other folks are doing and are there better ways The people who are doing better at acquisition at, you know, retention, um, like what are they doing? And really you can call it customer experience. You can call it brand. You can call it paying attention to product or customer, but that's how they were building their business. And I think it just in a more sustainable way, um, without losing the benefits, if you will, of the performance side. And by the way, I'd always rather have a brand because generally means like my acquisition is actually easier because I'm a known entity. Um, I can charge a premium on price. And if uh, looking at an exit, like people pay a premium for brand versus generic, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's so many benefits of it. Employees so, want to work with brands. You know, they're more attracted to the vision. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting time right now because a lot of the performance marketing uh, performance marketers like really want to to start embracing this side of e-commerce and see the potential in it. And um, I guess like maybe we'll, uh, my next question would be like, where, where do you start to prioritize like what a great experience, like some of the, I guess I'm asking the wrong question here. Like some of the stuff that I've seen that you've put together is sort of like the categorization maybe of like customer experience and whether that's like, you know, building an identity versus like building, you know, a product experience, where does somebody start or, or what are the best ways for them to start optimizing what they're doing on the product and the experience side? Yeah. I mean, so I, you know, someone asked me actually at baby bathwater this past time, um, Dave Sinek, I think asked like, you know, some questions around this and especially cause he's, their business is pretty performance driven. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the first question, probably the first question I should have asked him back, which uh, I talked to him later about, which I think like ultimately start with what are your business goals? Like for me, everything starts around there. You know, it's what are you trying to accomplish? Like I would, I would argue that even if you're in a cash flow business or you don't want to sell or you are in churn and burn or whatever, that's fine. Like there's still a value to this, but I think everything comes out of business goals and, um, and certainly personal goals. If you're, you know, if it's your own business and that's how you're doing it. Um, so I think that's the first thing, right. But ultimately like my goal. So when I talk about customer experience, Again, it's really like pay attention to the product, pay attention to the customer. Are you treating them in a way that you would prefer? Or that, sorry, most importantly, that they would prefer, right? Not the golden rule. It's actually the other side of the golden rule. Um, so that's one. And then like, you know, it's uh, my measurement on that a little bit is like, if your parents saw what you're doing, like all the things that were, you're doing, would you be proud to describe it? If it was recorded and videoed, which frankly these days, everything is. Um, and so like the idea of customer experience can sound pretty daunting and certainly the goal like that I kind of foresee as, you know, the, the holy grail of all this is that it's infused in your culture and just how you operate. But, you know, part of it is like, how do you start to infuse this in the day-to-day -day that you're operating? So as an example, customer acquisition, right? Like I think you all with um, now the Beard Club, the Dollar, Dollar Beard Club, like the idea of create, using um, customer experience as part of acquisition was I used to infuse in what you did, right? There was absolutely this sense of identity and certainly community that came in your, in the videos, right? Like that first video, like reeked of customer experience because it was, you know, are you a bearded man? And this idea of what does it mean? What is it like? What are the benefits? There was a sense of like wanting to be part of it. Like that's part of customer experience. And yeah, you could have gone with a different angle and I'm sure you guys probably threw out a bunch of different ideas, but like sometimes like grounding, you know, I can talk about customer experience philosophically, but like that's one way to ground it, which is, can you use the things that are, let's say you're performance driven that you're doing day to day 
how do you just start to make it a little bit better? And, you know, how do you start to test this stuff in a way that it's very tactical, which is like a video that is tapping into, let's say in that case, like identity and community. You know, I talk about Loot Crate, you know, it's for gamers. How do they use their language, you know, whether it's video on the lander, all that stuff to just start to connect with their customer in a much deeper way, as opposed to, I would say like the vanilla is like trying to play kind of like a couple different audiences and not be so deep on one with you all. It was very clear, right? Like who your audience was, but sometimes like you have, like I've had a client where, you know, their audience was moms, but it was also like dudes. And so, but the reality was 80% were moms. And so as opposed to like on the lander being very explicit about the moms on like the thank you page, showing the mom on the email, like showing, going deep in that identity, they kind of wanted to play both of them and not kind of offend the guys, if you will. But I think the win is way better when you go all in and in what you know is your core audience. And then the other people will either won't or what will fall off. But I just think like the win you, I've seen it, the win you get from speaking to your audience in a very direct way and that they're knowing that you know who they are, it just that win is way bigger. And so like, that's at the core of it. And so it could be your video ads, it could be your emails, it could be what's in the product, it could be the, your logo, um, it can show up a lot of different ways. Yeah, I feel like it's almost like, like you said, goes back to that, what do we want to achieve as a business? Um, and then, you know, it can be as a uh, sort of like top level and not really theoretical, but um, like on a personality level through the acquisition that you're doing um, and setting people up that, Hey, this is the identity of our customer then through to, cause I think a lot of people hyper focus on like packaging and the more tactile experiences of customer experience or like, you know, what's the delivery time? What's the packaging like, are we giving them a gift? What's like the post purchase follow up and stuff. And I think like when you start from that position and correct me if I'm wrong of like, Hey, what's the overall goal, then you're able to sort of see all these different areas and, and not maybe hyper-focus on, on one specific thing. Yeah, I mean, and first of all, I certainly don't think there's right and wrong around this by any stretch, and every business has got to pick and choose. Um, I mean, I think, the, again, the thing that's daunting is your brand gets built everywhere. So every touch point, like all that stuff, like it's, I think that's a very daunting part. But I, like my approach is just like if, how much are you actually, does the word, first of all, brand, come in your daily lexicon in the business and whether it's a single a solopreneur or a big team, you know, but like brand product customer, like how often, and honestly, like as obvious as I think those words are, it is shocking to me, like certainly with my clients or friends, just how little sometimes it can come up. And I think, so that's, that's part of it is just make it part of the lexicon and then just start picking. I think like identity and community are hugely um, impactful if you can tap into that. I think most businesses can, but yeah, I mean, look, I think your acquisition side, all the things you just mentioned, like these are the parts where you want to make sure it is a great experience. Um, and by the way, I get that like, sometimes you can't execute the way you want tech. You don't have the money, whatever that's like, I understand that, but you've got to start making sure like it's part of the conversation and part of what you're doing. Um, so again, it may be tactical like returns and refunds or account management. Like if you're a subscription business and you don't have like account management and you don't say, I, like, I'm a big fan and believer of order notification, of skipping, all that kind of functionality. I think that is part of customer experience because, yeah, you may get an extra shipment or two out of a customer, but the brand impact and the word of mouth impact and the, the feeling that a customer gets, like, I'm a, I'm a believer that it's, it's way worse. And I just look at the, the language that people use, I've used, when that experience has been really poor. So referrals are one thing, negative feedback in that way that people are posting is, you know, it, it's a lot louder. Yeah, so, we totally experienced that too. And, you know, when we first started chatting was we were great at the acquisition side at that, like, hey, here's our identity. And people were all on board on that. They got it. Um, but then, like, you know, we were limited by tech in terms of the, like, being able to manage subscriptions part. Uh, we were scared to email people because we were like, oh, maybe they'll cancel. And it, it took a bit of a step back and a mindset shift to realize that we were actually screwing ourselves out of long-term profit by focusing on sort of the short-term profit. And we were creating these bad experiences that people were talking quite openly and loudly about um, in favor of trying to bring more people in the door and try and do what we were really good at. And, you know, took that sort of humbling self-awareness to go, oh, you know, we're really dropping the ball on experience other than just our videos, you know, and 
I think that, uh, like, are, are there any suggestions you have for people that have one great part of their experience locked in that want to start to, to do better? Or should it be as obvious as it was for us? Well, I mean, one thing, you know, it's the idea of emailing your customer and worrying about if they're going to cancel. Um, so like, I get it. There's a tension, right? Sometimes a customer may like your product or service and you know, your email is a trigger for them because like they just start stacking it up. But if fundamentally your customer, like you're really worried because you feel like your product is not that good or the customer really doesn't want it. Like that's a bigger problem that, you know, anything I'm saying or all the tactical hacks, like that ain't going to solve that, that kind of problem. But like, I'll, I'll use myself. Like I love athletic greens. Um, and I kind of bounce between Organifi and Athletic Greens, but you know, I love those products, but the reality is like, I don't consume enough in 30 days. And so, but I, I'm a fan. So I've got to pause. I go on and off pausing with those folks because like I travel or I just forget one day. And so the reason people cancel isn't necessarily because like they don't like your product. You know, obviously you've got to do what you can to help encourage usage and reinforce all that to those kinds of things. But you know, the reality is like sometimes people cancel because like they, they literally just got too much or they've forgotten or they've traveled. So I think you got to remind yourself as a, as a marketer, um, you know, that you're not trying to sneak in and, but it's also like, what are the things you can do to help people um, consume? And then also like, if I've been paused, like maybe every couple of weeks, you send me an email saying, Hey man, you pause. Like, do you want to restart? Like very few people are that's for a product I like, I'm not bothered by that. And if like, it's like a friend or a follow-up, it's like, Hey, checking in. Right. Um, yeah. but you know, in terms of like prioritization, cause no matter whether, again, whether you're a solopreneur or like a billion dollar business, everyone is resource constrained. So part of the thing here is really about prioritization and really when, cause like I can talk about 20 different ideas. The reality is very few businesses can execute 20. They're trying to just do one or two. Right. And so what I always say is like, where are your biggest points of leverage in the business? Um, and so what, what kind of the, what are the nuts you're trying to crack? And so is it acquisition? Is it retention? Um, ultimately some of it's obviously out of analytics to know like where are the pain points. And then there's also this qualitative side where like one of my friends asked me, what are the things I should stop doing? And I think that's actually an important one too. Cause again, a lot of work I do with my clients is subtraction. It's not addition because oftentimes they're trying to do too many things as opposed to what are the areas that are most high leverage um, but sometimes also the things to stop doing are just look at your, you know, what's the feedback you get from customers that are the constant complaints and the stuff that's legit, right? And oftentimes too, we know what those things are. We've either deprioritized or we're like, we'll get to that at some point. Or it's like, Hey man, I can't stop doing that. Cause that's generating revenue. When in fact, in the long run, it's really killing your business. So part of it is like, when you look at what's, what to stop doing is, kind of take an honest assessment of where the business is and like, what do people complain about the most that you have been putting off? Um, or what are the things you continue to do that drives your customers crazy and at least work on a path towards making that better? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's look, obviously there's, I'm a, I'm a data guy first and foremost is use that to help inform, but start with your highest leverage areas or what you deem at least the highest leverage and start figuring out how do we like start to infuse some of these components that starts to create a real sense of connection and engagement. Um, you know, the, the, some of the language I use is like, what's the story you're in your customer's head? Because like that story in your customer's head is what's going to affect them to buy, to buy again, and certainly to tell their friends, family, post on social, do whatever. And so I think part of winning is around winning that story in, their, in your customer's head. And that is absolutely tied into acquisition, retention, and building the brand. And so what is the story in your customer's head you need them to tell? Or what is the one that's currently there that you need to start to make a lot better? Yeah, I think um, it's interesting too, as, as, your, as your business scales and, you know, it's, it's not like e-commerce isn't like running a corner store, right? You're not face to face with people all the time, right? And especially as you ramp up, you know, you might see comments on social media, but you become like increasingly disconnected from the end user of your products oftentimes. Um, and then finding out ways to reconnect with them, I think not only gives you ideas on what you're doing wrong, but you know, a reconnection of like, why are you actually doing this? Why does your business exist? Totally. And if it's a lifestyle business then you're probably not interested in talking to your customers, but if it's like, you want to build something meaningful, like, Oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm like working so hard on this. And, and that's why I want to build something. Um, but on that sort of like feedback loop, 
what, what have you found are some of the best ways to, to extract that information from these precious people who are literally fi financing the operation, but also hold the keys to what some of the biggest opportunities for you are? Yeah, I mean, I think, so again, like if you're a business owner or marketer or whatever, uh, one of the things right off the bat to note is most, for most businesses, the lowest comp person is generally customer service. And they're the ones who have the most direct interaction with your customers. And uh, there's kind of a disconnect there to a certain extent, right? And so uh, I'm not necessarily encouraging this to change how you pay, but like it's about training, about connection to your point. And so one of the most valuable things I've really worked with clients on doing and seeing it have a big impact in their business and how people understand it is, co is contacting customers. So picking a handful of people every, like, and I think actually if your team can do this on once a month, once a quarter, um, it's really, really valuable. And so that can look like, Call a batch of customers who just ordered, call a batch of customers who are two weeks in, and then call a batch of customers who are 60 days. Um, it's, you'd love to talk to the cancels. Rarely can you get a hold of them. But, you know, it's why did you buy? What are your expectations? Like, what else did you look at? Um, anything else we can do for you? Like, how many businesses call a customer? And even from, like, people watching, like, how many times have you ever been contacted on the phone or, like, email just, like, some kind of that kind of thing that's not a survey? Um, you know, as much as people don't want to pick up the phone, like that's, you know, there's something there to talk to people. And then, you know, two weeks in 60 days in 30, whatever, there's no perfect rule on this, but after people have had enough time to use the product, how is it matching your expectations? Um, and ideally, yeah, you work with the call the same people, but honestly, if you just talk to a batch of people and don't let that be the limiter, you're going to get feedback. Um, so, you know, calling and, and, and speaking to customers Sometimes you got to incentivize them, but I always try not to um, just to get some direct feedback. The other big thing is to order from yourself. And that is, um, you know, again, like it's, you can do the secret shopper thing, but literally go in and yeah, if you want to make a fake name and email, great, but actually go through the purchase process yourself, like click the buttons, call if it's, you know, if there's a, someone to call and then go through some of the things that you would expect a customer to do, which is like if you're subscription or repeat customer, like what is that like? And then certainly can canceling and returning. Um, you will be shocked oftentimes at what that experience is like. And it probably doesn't match the one you want your business to have. Yeah. And I think um, it, what's interesting about that too is that a lot of people will, you know, there's certainly loud people when they have a bad experience or the product takes too long. But a lot of people might just cancel and you'll never know, right? So if you're not doing those tests yourself, uh, which I recommend people do too, or actually calling and talking to people like cancels are great to get a hold of. But like you said, it's really difficult. Um, but I mean, I've been called, you know, I think maybe two or three times by companies that are just genuinely interested. Like, Hey, how are you enjoying your product? And I will always, that was? Uh, so one of them was like actually uh, a software that I was using called press rush, which you can like kind of access journalist information and, and email them directly and stuff. And the founder called me and he was like sort of new to scaling up the business. He's like, Hey, I'm just picking people and calling them. Cool. Um, I can't remember the physical product businesses though. I wish I had though. Um, because it, like I, I was willing to give feedback. I'm like, this is cool. Like they actually, they give a shit about me. That, that feels nice. Right. You know, and you know, it, it's certainly self-serving in a way for them, but it, it makes their business better. Right. But it also makes me feel like they care. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you get a, if you get like someone to engage or to post about it, Great. It's raw for me. It's a data, you know, thing. Yeah. You just like, again, you can get disconnected from your customer, um, especially when you're straight e-com and, uh, and you don't have meetups or you don't have like, you know, brick and mortar, which again, most people, you know, in the e-com world don't. Um, yeah. I mean, you're just, I think you're like, and it's also, it's easy to respond to what's on Facebook or wherever and your reviews. But again, like a dynamic conversation with a customer, like that is, that is gold. And like you spend, an hour a week, an hour a month, I guarantee you're going to discover a few things that you didn't know about your business that, um, but, and positive and negative, by the way. And so that's part of the thing. It's like, I'm not looking, we always focus on the critical side, but it may be, hey, this is a part of the business or a product or feature or whatever it is that we didn't realize was just as important as it is. And maybe we've got to reinforce that even more. Um, so it could be addition, it could be subtract, it could be any of that stuff, right? So, um, but just getting that feedback from the customer in a very real way. And then honestly, like honest, ordering your own customer, ordering your own product. Like when was the last time you owned, or, ordered your own product? Um, and just see how does it show up? Literally how long, what is that experience like? Like that's a big, big deal. Um, because it's just, it's so easy to forget 
Um, again, as simple as that sounds, like probably you're going to identify a couple things that, you know, you didn't expect. Yeah. Funny, like side note, I actually, we were doing testing for a new update that we had on the beard club website. And uh, so I ordered a package to my mom's place in Canada from California. And then I forgot about the subscription and I got another one the next month and it built my card. I was like, ah, beard club. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I gotta say, like, order notification, like, again, like, for, as a consumer and a marketer, like, I get why people don't do that. Um, but I'm telling you, like, I think the example I used to always give was like, honestly, Dollar Shave Club was the first that I'd really seen do this that make that order notification a promotional opportunity. So yeah. you build the brand because you give people a heads up, but you also say, hey, do you want to add anything to your order? And so, like, if you only have one SKU, I get it. Um, but most people have more than that. And it's what are the things that actually can help. The customer and use it as an opportunity for them to buy more. Um, and like the, the, but we work with butcher box to make their process better and blazing deals that were members only. And like that kind of thing. Now you're seeing it a little bit more, but I still also think like you get the brand win, the customer actually appreciates it, but you can also offset some of the churn with yeah. promotional opportunities. Yeah. I would never advise anyone to do the way, like we certainly smartened up about it too. And we're like, well, we need to start talking to our customers and it like, I feel like the lifetime value and maybe this kind of leads into another question uh, because you are, uh, you know, you have your math background, your numbers guy. Um, like how are you seeing like the measurements on some of these and like the return on investment and in some of these like more brand building experience based um, efforts? Like I know some of them are probably harder to measure, but uh, I think I feel like in the long term, lifetime value has got to be one of the biggest bumps that you'll see. Yeah, I mean, so like just as an example, like this, like let's say pausing and skipping. Um, uh, I'm part of a group where a guy, actually a former client, had posted something around. They did some analysis around um, people who paused and, and pause slash skip, and just like I forget, it was like 30% more valuable than um, for people who didn't. And so, um, in terms of like their, can their ability to cancel, and so um, like I can pull the exact numbers, but you know, the, it is definitely like that kind of thing. Like having, giving people the opportunity to pause and skip as long as also you have a follow up sequence on something. And even if you don't, frankly, like just have allowing people to do that, like that's double digit improvements on retention just right off the bat, as opposed to like either don't like it stop, it's on or off and that's it. And so yeah. that's certainly one of them. Um, I'm just kind of looking at a, at a, at a table I have um, to see like where I can give you like more exact numbers. Um, so order notification, is so I will say like that's that's I think one of the tougher ones because I think you're going to see a little bit of a net churn down uh, you're going to see a net churn increase sorry but your brand lift and then your um, again this is along with pause and skip at least in the short term you're going to see that but over time I, it's that's a double digit that's a double digit win here um, um, yeah I, I think it's more like like I don't have any like I don't have the right number yet for you in in front of me um, other than to say that. I, I would say look at the other businesses that you are asked aspiring towards and modeling off of. And so whether it's you all, whether it's like Loot Crate that is nine figures, like I give like Harley Davidson as an example, like they don't spend money on paid media, but they spend money on like, uh, they have these local community groups. And so the more you can, and that is consumption and engagement. And that absolutely goes back into acquisition and identity, right? So um, you know, the more you can engage your customers, uh, keep them like connected, treat them well, you're just, you're going to get better numbers. And as much as people want to invest in Facebook, um, or ads and things like that, investing in your products, probably at the marginal cost relative to your ads, like what are the biggest complaints? And then start to measure that improvement over time. Um, certainly one of the biggest increases I've seen is when it comes to like things like operational stuff, like delivery the faster you can just, just the world we live in, I've seen absolutely double digit. Yeah. 15, 20% improvements in retention um, and customer ser service contacts when your delivery time is faster. So mm -hmm. when a customer gets the product faster, they're um, happier. They are not contacting customer service with Wismo. Where's my order calls. And that uh, again, like 15, 20% improvements in retention and also in decreased contacts, which is obviously a cost. Um, so like that's, that's an operational one. And then look, the reality of um, like things like identity and community, you know, part of that comes into like, a, let's say a Facebook video ad, you know, in general, I've seen that the ones that are, that are having some sort of connection um, relative to like a static ad or something that doesn't tap into that, 
um, you know, just, just works better. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of a broader statement, but certainly seen that kind of improvement uh, pretty much across the board. Yeah. All good pieces of advice. Appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to kind of end off uh, our interviews with something on a you know more personal level. And I've seen you perform at a very high level. So you go to lots of events. You've got obviously clients. You now have a business uh, with your wife that you're helping with. You have a family. Um, what are some of the things that you do to, to, to keep just going so hard and accomplishing so much? Uh, uh, you know, I think first off, like the reason I do what I do or anything I do, um, you know, I'm obviously personally driven, but with a family, like, I think that's, you know, that's when people say like, you know, what's your why? Like, I think that's where it comes from. Right. And so my wife is my family, you know, my wife, uh, we have two sons, uh, we're trying for number three. Um, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm five houses down from one of my sisters and my parents and my other sister a couple miles away. So that's what drives me. Um, I think it's easy to, I was just talking to someone literally two, three hours ago about, um, it's easy to get very caught up in that. And it feels like each year gets busier. Uh, and trying to like figure out like at what point do things feel more sane? I'm not sure they do. Um, and uh, it's easier to say than to do. But you know, at the end of the day, like uh, my goal and you know how I want to operate is to you know be able to spend time with the people that are most valuable. Um, want to have an impact? Like again, like some of the stuff sounds cheesy and cliche, but like that's the reality of it. Um, and then I just have to kind of take care of myself too. Like, I have a Peloton right there, so uh, I'm a big fan. Um, and I mean, they've done a phenomenal job. So, you know, I got to take care of myself. It's look, I'm a basics and fundamentals guy when, with professionally, but I think personally too, like I think the keys to like happiness and being content and sad, whatever kind of word you want to use, like it's not rocket science fundamentally. I think it's about figuring out what it is for you as an individual. And like, for me, it's like my family, it's taking care of myself. It's like, you know, travel. Um, that's a big, big deal. And that's what motivates me. Um, and so like, you know, I've kind of got like things on my wall, like do the work, um, you know, like never going back to certain things and um, just keeping reminded of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got to take care of myself, take care of my family, like allow them to take care of me, um, you know, and spend time on the stuff that's that I feel most connected to, which is those things. And obviously other people have different motivations, but I think that's you got to figure that out for yourself. Um, I think we should leave right there. Thank you so much, brother. This awesome interview. I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure, Alex.